Why do you need to exercise? While the answer to this question may seem obvious, the truth of the matter is it's not well communicated throughout the mainstream fitness industry. And because of that, many people are resistant to the idea of exercising consistently. Well, on this week's episode of the Exercise is Health podcast, we're actually going to play a presentation that we did for a medical school where we talked to future physicians about why it's so important for them and their patients to be exercising. We're going to cue our introduction and then we're going to dive right into this conversation. Hey, welcome back exercisers to the Exercise is Health podcast brought to you by Exercise for Life Studios, where we believe that your health is your most valuable asset. And the single best thing that you can do to both boost and protect this asset is exercise. Specifically, exercise is geared towards building the health and function of your muscles. We're your hosts, Charlie and Julie. And today we are playing part one of a two part episode that we are going to do where we went to a medical school, Midwestern University, here in the western suburbs of Chicago, and presented to future physicians there on why it is so important for them and their patients to be exercising. Even though this idea of making sure that you're exercising is something that we talk about all the time on this podcast, and most people understand, like, okay, yeah, it would be good if I was exercising, how to exercise and exactly why it's so important are often not well understood. And so in this presentation, we actually got to present to future physicians about why it is absolutely necessary that not only they make sure that they're exercising, but they really, really encourage their patients, their future patients, to make sure that they are exercising as well. Like I said, this presentation was a little over 50 minutes, so we're actually gonna split this episode in half. This week, we're gonna give you part one, and then in a couple of weeks, we're gonna break down part two. Uh, but let's dive right into the first part of this presentation. Rock, thanks so much, man. I appreciate it, yeah. Hey, welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me today, Rock. Thank you so much for putting forth effort to get, get this all set up. You know, I was gonna come up with a catchy title for today, uh, but I find that clarity beats creativity 10 times out of 10. So I decided to be just very straightforward about what we're talking about and tell you that you and your patients need to exercise. Uh, how future physicians can use a simple three-step framework to help them and their patients maximize their brain power, build lasting health, strength, and function, and dominate med school. Sound good? Yeah. All right, cool. So I'm going to go through a quick disclaimer before we get into everything today. Uh, first thing is I'm going to give kind of like a 10,000-foot overview. If you want to take like a picture or whatever so you know what you're agreeing to by being here, that's totally cool. But I'm just going to kind of go through this kind of quick. All right. The first thing is that any testimonials or results I'm sharing, I'm not going to be saying that the exact same experiences will be happening for you. Uh, number two, um, I'm video recording this. The contents will be repurposed on our social platforms, podcasts, everything like that. Um, and number three, by being here at this presentation, you're agreeing not to hold myself, my company, or any of our officers liable for the results that may come from implementing what we're talking about today, all right? So let's get into it. First of all, do this for me. And you all are eating, so you don't have to raise your hand, but just kind of like mentally raise your hand. How many of you have heard that heart disease is a leading cause of death? All right, now this is something that I heard for a long time as well, okay? Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's actually not a complete story, okay? And it's not a complete story because the actual leading cause of death is physical inactivity, all right? Let me tell you what I mean low levels of physical inactivity and below average levels of physical inactivity have been shown to be more detrimental to human health and longevity than heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and even smoking. Now, if you look at the top 10 killers of Americans every single year, eight of the top 10 can be either directly or indirectly linked back to heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and smoking, all right? So physical inactivity is a huge issue across the board for people from at a health perspective, from a longevity perspective. So what do we do about this? Well, a lot of times the solutions that we're given are to just start moving more, just move more throughout your day. Or we'll say, okay, well, walking, walking is the best form of exercise. All right. I've heard that so many times we're going to explain why that actually may not be the case. Or we'll say, oh, go and do classes. Okay. Do the classes, do the stuff that you like to do, but there's actually very little guidance being given on what we need to do to exercise in order to be healthy. And that's where I come in, all right? So on top of the little guidance, there are a number of problems that arise with how mainstream fitness is trying to guide us to exercise today, okay? 
The first problem that often comes up with the mainstream fitness industry is that most ways of exercising are actually making people less healthy. In fact, every single day, there are more doctor's visits due to issues and in injuries from exercise than there are diagnosed cases of heart disease, diabetes, and cancer combined. In other, in other words, the thing that is supposed to be preventing us from going to the doctor's office is one of the leading causes for us to go there. So that's a huge issue, okay? The next big issue is that the current options of exercise are engaging fewer than one in four Americans. People just aren't interested in the options that are being presented, either because it's not intriguing to them or from a lifestyle perspective, they can't figure out how to work it in. And for those that do say, okay, I am gonna exercise and try to do it consistently, most of them or a fair number of them end up in the doctor's office because of injuries and issues. So you can see why this is a problem. The third big problem is that the mainstream fitness industry is focused on the wrong things when it comes to exercise. They're focused on entertainment. And as I'll talk about later, they're focused on distraction, okay? They're not focused on what actually needs to be done with exercise in order to make people healthier. They're talking about burning calories and trying to lose weight quickly. This idea of no pain, no gain perpetuates the mainstream fitness industry. And they're trying to make workouts that look good on social media, but actually do very little to improve your health and function. So honestly, it's no surprise that the current state of fitness is making people less healthy. But what can we do about it? Because we're left with a question right now, and the, or the thought rather. The thought that we're left with is that exercising is arguably the most powerful thing that somebody can do to improve their overall health and well-being. But it's been so distorted by the mainstream fitness industry that it's alienating over 75% of the population and creating more issues in those who are participating than three of the top 10 killers combined. Like this is a really big deal. We have this really powerful thing in exercise that for so many people is actually making them worse. All right. So why should you care? Well, right now, you're a medical student, okay? And what that means is you need your brain to be able to function well. You need your creativity, you need your attention, you need your problem solving, you need your information processing centers to work as well as they can right now in this moment in life, okay? You need to be able to have the mental and physical capacity and stamina to work long hours and still think sharply. And you need to be able to feel well throughout your day so you can do your job to the best of your ability without being held back by your body. And the great news is, is when you exercise for your health, exercise can do all of those things, all right? But someday, when you start seeing patients, your patients are going to put your opinions on their lifestyle and what they should be doing and the advice that you're giving them higher than almost anybody else's, okay? So what you tell your patients to do from a lifestyle perspective is going to carry a huge weight with them, all right? And the more simple and the more straightforward you can get, make your advice to what you're giving to them, the more likely they are going to be to follow it and follow through with it, okay? And to follow through consistently. And this is a really big deal because when it comes to improving the health and function of your body with exercise, the name of the game really is consistency. So today, what we're going to be covering is number one, the single most important aspect of exercise to build your health, strength, and brain power that the entire fitness industry is missing. Number two, I'm going to go through the two types of exercise that you and your patients need to be doing to maximize your brain function, build your long-term health, and ward off chronic illness. And number three, I'm going to go through a simple three-step system that you can implement immediately to help you build the habit of exercising consistently and in a way that will be sustainable for your body to, for decades to come. Sound good? All right, sweet. So, Let's get into it. The single most important aspect of exercise to build your health, strength, and brain power that the entire fitness industry is missing. So let's start with this question. What is exercise? All right, just answer it for yourself in your head. When you think of exercise, what do you think of? A lot of times we think of an activity. Maybe it's running or swimming or lifting weights, okay? Maybe we say, oh, you know what? Exercise is movement. To which I say, okay, but what about doing like a plank or a wall squat? Is that not doing exercise? And so I say, okay, well, maybe movement really actually isn't a necessary component of exercise, but maybe something like sweating is. I say, okay, well, what about sitting in a sauna? You're sweating then and you're not moving. If you're doing it isometric in a sauna, does that count? Well, yes, because you're doing it isometric, but if you're just sitting there and not moving, does that count? So there's a lot of convolution of like what actually constitute exercise, all right? If I say, okay, we're gonna go to Oak Brook Mall and we're gonna walk around the mall and go shopping. 
Do we call that exercise or do we call that shopping? I said, but what if the shops are closed and we're walking before everybody gets there and we call that mall walking? Now is that exercise, right? And so we have a little bit of uncertainty about what exercise actually is. So we can think of all the different ways of what exercise or uh, ways to exercise, what exercise may be. And we start to think about, all right, what do these things have in common? And really what it all comes down to is muscle contraction. Every single health benefit that you can get from exercising is a derivative of muscle contraction. And understanding this, understanding that exercise really just comes down to challenging and contracting your muscles changes everything when you start to implement it consistently with your workouts and how you see exercise and how you recommend exercise to others, okay? So how did this idea, or so we have, a, uh, we have a new definition of exercise. Because of this, we have a new definition of exercise. This new definition of exercise is challenging your muscles with the intent of improving the health and function of your body. Challenging your muscles with the intent of improving the health and function of your body. Now, both of those components are necessary. Challenging your muscles and the intent to improve the health and function of your body, I'm gonna explain why, okay? How did this come to be though? Uh, so in 2019, my wife and I hosted an event uh, called the Schaumburg Health Summit, all right? And this was designed to be like a TEDx type event where we had 11 different presenters and we rented out a ballroom in a hotel and we had a catered, we had a DJ, we had vendors. Like it was awesome. It was an all day event. We had like 75 people attending. It was amazing, okay? And I was going to be the final speaker of the day for this event. And so I knew that I wanted to talk about something really important, but I wasn't sure what. And I thought, you know what? So often we're told this idea that we exercise and we live longer, but we're never actually told why. All right. We never actually told how exercise helps us live longer. And if any way of exercising will actually help us live longer, if there's very specific things we need to do with our exercise in order to live longer. So I decided that I was going to dive into this. All right. And I thought, OK, well, what things have I heard about in the past that would help me to live longer? Right. And so I thought, OK, well, you know, I've heard about this idea of like mitochondria and, you know, like as your cells are being able to produce ATP better. But if they're not able to do that, like maybe that might shorten your longevity. So I thought, OK, exercise mitochondria, like that's a pretty straightforward connection there. But, you know, let me explore it a little bit more. Uh, then I thought, okay, but what about this idea of like autophagy, okay, where, you know, your, your bodies will clean up and clear out damaged cells, all right? We don't want those to accumulate. That can lead to chronic issues. So, okay, if those systems aren't working as well, maybe that will shorten our lifespan. Maybe exercise will help to promote that. And I thought, well, what about this idea of telomeres, all right? And, you know, when your cells divide and your chromosomes replicate, and, you know, the telomeres get a little bit shorter every time that happens to the point where they won't get any shorter any longer. And then it appears that your cells won't divide as easily. Um, so maybe we start to lose the ability to replace and repair damaged cells. So, well, let me explore exercise in that. And I thought, okay, well, what if we could keep the cells from being damaged in the first place? Well, what damages cells? We're reactive oxygen species. Okay, cool. Let me explore reactive oxygen species and the potential protective effects of exercise with reactive oxygen species. So I started looking at papers with this, and I had this idea that it really needs to come down to muscle contraction. Where does a muscle contraction process fit into influencing all this? Now, in grad school, I'd studied all the different steps of the muscle contraction process, so I was fairly familiar with the different actions that had to take place as part of muscle contraction. And I started reading these papers, and I started seeing things like PGC1-alpha and NRF2, and I thought, okay, that, that seems familiar, but I just can't quite place it. So I started looking at, okay, what influences, what activates, you know, PGC1-alpha, what uh, activates NRF2? And I came across the enzyme AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase. And I thought, okay, there's something here. Because I remember from the muscle contraction process that when you have an ATP molecule that binds to the myosin head and then it breaks apart into ADP and P, and you get enough buildup of ADP, you have an enzyme called myokinase that combines the ADP to make ATP and AMP. But that only happens, well, it happens all the time, but it happens higher at higher levels of muscle contraction because myokinase is a low, uh, a low affinity enzyme, so it needs a large buildup of ADP. And I thought, there's something here. There's something here because now I can relate the muscle contraction process back to building mitochondria. Now I can relate the muscle contraction process back to autophagy. Now I can relate it back to increasing and protecting telomere length. Now I can relate it back to protecting ourselves from reactive oxygen species damage. But the thing was, they, there wasn't anything that was specifically laid out as far as step one, step two, step three. 
So I took this information and I created that step one, step two, step three, that model of how exercise actually helps us to live longer, okay? So that was 2019. Then 2020 came around and I thought, okay, but that's great for living longer, but what about all these other health benefits that we're told about from exercise? The cardiovascular benefits, the brain health benefits. You know, where does muscle contraction come into those? So I started looking at this and started seeing, okay, can muscle contraction influence cardiovascular health? Can muscle contraction influence brain health? Can muscle contraction manage chronic inflammation, help us ward off chronic disease and illness? And that really became the premise for my book that I released in 2021 called The Exercise for Life Method. Um, and I found that every single health benefit that we relate to exercise, the underlying mechanism, mechanisms of which could all be brought back to muscle contraction. Whether it's lowering blood pressure, increasing chamber size of the left ventricle, strengthening the heart, increasing brain volume, improving memory, executive function, creativity, warding off dementia, preventing chronic disease and illness, decreasing systemic inflammation, it all came back to muscle contraction. I thought, holy crap, this is a thing. This really is a thing. Like when we think about, oh, you know, exercise is this or that or this or that, it really just comes back to muscle contraction. So the common principle across the board for these health benefits was the more muscles contracted, the more frequently they contracted, the more intensely they contracted, and the longer they contracted for, the more health benefits that are seen, all right? But the mainstream fitness industry gets this wrong. And where they get it wrong is, like I said, they're focused on the entertainment and they're focusing on distracting us from the muscle contraction. You go into the class and it's all about the music, the energy, the community, which is great but it's distracting you from like, oh, block out what your body is feeling. Just push it, just a few more reps. Don't connect with your body. And so because of that, there's an issue that a lot of people start to experience. And the issue is that even though they may be getting more muscle contraction, the more muscle contraction only increases health to a point, all right? More contraction only equals more health benefits to a point. And that point, is as long as the exercise is appropriate for somebody's body. In other words, as soon as the exercise becomes inappropriate for somebody's body, we increase the likelihood that we're gonna start damaging our muscles. When muscle damage occurs, we start to increase the, inflam the inflammatory response. We see uh, increased release of TNF-alpha and IL-1, okay? We actually see a decreased health response um, from exercise when we start to get increased TNF-alpha and IL-1. And we see a decreased ability to return to exercise consistently because people are having to take days off from working out because of being sore, which means they're losing days when they could be getting the health benefits of exercise that they're ultimately not, all right? So the shift that needs to take place, that this idea changes everything fundamentally about how we see and think about exercise. We need to shift our mindset about exercise from what's going on around us and outside of our body to what's going on within our body and specifically a muscle contraction. What this means is when you go to the gym and you're trying to work out, you're not thinking about, I'm trying to do two more reps because it's not about the weights moving up and down. It's about connecting with and focusing and challenging and squeezing your muscles. And the more you can focus on that, the less likely it'll be that you're exercising inappropriately for your body. The less likely it'll be that you get these, this um, landslide, uh, this cascade of negative side effects from exercise. And the more likely you will be to be able to return to exercise in a much shorter time period, which means you get to keep building your health with exercise. But this leads us to a new question. And this new question, now that we understand that muscle contraction is the key, is how can somebody exercise in a way that has a necessary frequency, intensity, duration, and muscle volume challenge to get all the health benefits without overdoing it and breaking our body down? Because there's a fine line to balance with this. And so we're gonna go into the two types of exercise. So the two types of exercise that you and your patients need to be doing to maximize your brain function, build your long-term health, and ward off chronic illness. So have you heard of this idea that the minimum amount of exercise you need throughout the week is 150 minutes? All right. It's a pretty common idea. Let me tell you a little bit about where it came from. So when I was in grad school, I had this professor and when he would present, he was constantly pacing back and forth. And I thought, all right, this guy's presented, you know, he used to teach at Stanford. He's taught all over. Like, why does he have this nervous energy going back and forth? I just thought it was his thing. And about two years into my program, he stopped and he said, do you know why I'm constantly walking back and forth? I, was like, I have no idea why. And he goes, 
I'm walking back and forth because if you exercise for 60 minutes, you go for a 60 minute run every single morning and then you sit at breakfast and then you sit on your way to work and then you sit at work and you sit over lunch and you sit uh, in the afternoon and you sit on your commute home and you sit at dinner and you sit and watch TV and you lie down and go to sleep. That's 60 minutes of physical activity that you're doing every single day, followed by 23 consecutive hours of being sedentary. That is not enough to prevent or reverse insulin resistance. 60 consecutive minutes of exercise, even though you're doing it every single day, it's not enough. What you need to do is you need to break up that 23 hours of being sedentary with little bouts of physical activity. So I'm standing up and I'm walking around, you know, intermittently throughout my day. It's not very long. It doesn't take a lot of effort, but I'm doing that to be able to prevent and reverse any kind of like in, uh, insulin resistance that may be building up in my body. And I thought, okay, this is fascinating because now this brings me to two types of exercise that we all need to be doing. All right. The first is what I call all the time exercise. All right. All the time exercise is physical activity that you get throughout your day that you don't typically think of as exercise. All right. It's standing up, walking up the stairs, down the stairs, back to your seat. Okay. It's done for three to five to maybe 10 minutes at a time, but multiple times throughout your day, times where you would be sitting for a long period of time, you're getting up, you're standing up, you're moving around just a little bit. It's done a very low intensity level. So you're not breathing hard. You're not sweating. You don't need to change your clothes or anything like that. And you wouldn't necessarily think like, oh, that's going to be my workout for today but it's physical activity. It's challenging your muscles with the intent of improving the health and function of your body. So we're calling it exercise. We call it all the time exercise because as the name would apply, it needs to be done all the time. All right. A minimum of three bouts of 10 minutes a day is what needs to be done. Okay. Where that 150 minutes came from three bouts, 10 minutes a day, five days a week They say, okay, well that that's going to be enough to get these results. But what ends up being a little bit better is if you can do it in every like 45, 60 minutes, sometimes every 30 minutes, but just three, five, 10 minutes at a time, but do it more frequently than that. Okay. So that's the first step. The second type is what I call special event exercise. Now, this is what we typically think of when we think of working out, okay? It is a special event in your calendar, all right? So this is going to the gym. This is doing the class. This is going for the run, lifting the weights, meeting with your trainer, whatever it is, okay? It's a higher intensity relative to all the time exercise. It's done for a longer duration relative to all the time exercise, but it's more condensed, relative to all the time exercise. Meaning most people aren't doing, you know, three to five workouts throughout the day. They might do one workout, but then you move consistently throughout your day after that, right? So those are two types of exercise. Here's the thing with special event exercise, because this is the thing that gets most people in trouble. There are some guidelines that we need to follow, okay? We have three guidelines for you. The first guideline is you need to focus on squeezing your muscles. You need to keep your focus internal within your body. This is one of the most challenging things for people to do because we are so conditioned that exercise is like a sport. Like how, how can I best my time from last week? Can I do more reps or more weight than last week? And we start to think about all the things that are outside of our body. But remember, health occurs inside of our body. All right. It's muscle contraction that drives the health changes. That's where our focus needs to be. All right. And from the motor control literature, when you focus on squeezing a muscle, let's say you're doing a biceps curl and you can just stand there and just do a biceps curl. But when you really focus on doing the biceps curl, OK, your central nervous system actually sends more signal to your biceps. OK, from a health perspective, that's going to drive more muscle contraction, which is going to drive more health changes just simply by switching your focus from the dumbbell in your hand to the muscle within your body. Okay. That's guideline number one. Guideline number two, the goal of doing the exercise is to improve the health and function of your body. All right. You're not thinking, oh, I'm doing the squats to lift the weight. I'm running the, you know, I'm running the, uh, the, the five miles or whatever to, you know, burn the next 30 minutes. Like that, that's not what's going through your mind. Okay. The goal of doing the exercise is to improve the health and function of your body, which leads to guideline, guideline number three. You don't have any relative comparisons that you're bringing with you into your workouts, okay? You don't care about the amount of points you score or the amount of points the other team scores. You don't care if last week you did 100 pounds. You're not trying to do 105 pounds this week. You don't care if last week you did five pull-ups. You're not trying to do six pull-ups this week. 
the entire purpose of going and exercising is to improve the health and function of your body. And you do that through focusing on squeezing your muscles, all right? So we have those three guidelines, and both types of exercise are needed, all right? Because here's the thing. All the time exercise is not intense enough or done for a long enough period of time to get the health benefits of special event exercise. And special event exercise is not done intermittently enough to get the health benefits of all the time exercise. So you might be sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, but, dude, we got, like, school, we got you know, studying, we got so much other stuff going on. How do we fit in not only just moving consistently throughout the day, but actually working out on a consistent basis. So we need a system to follow. And that's what we're going to go into right now. A All right. So that was part one of the presentation that we did for Midwestern University. Now, as you heard in this presentation, not only is exercise, it's something that's absolutely necessary, but how most people are exercising is leaving their body in a worse condition than when they started. So clearly that is a huge issue. How do we go about solving it? That's exactly what we're going to get to in part number two. That will be coming out in a couple weeks. In the meantime, if you'd like more hands-on guidance from us on how to go about exercising in a way that builds your health, that builds your strength, that builds your function, and that you can do conveniently in the comfort of your own home, we encourage you to check out our Exercise for Life membership. You will get access to hundreds of on-demand workouts as well as live workouts, courses, and a whole bunch of other stuff. When you enroll for the Exercise for Life membership, all you have to do to get started is go to www www.exerciseforlifestudios.com forward slash membership. So who do you know that needs to hear this episode? Who do you know that is hesitant to start their process of exercising because they feel like mm, maybe it's not something that I absolutely need to do? Share this episode with them so they can understand why it's important for them to exercise, why it's important for their family to exercise, and why it's important that they exercise in a way that is sustainable for their life and for the duration of their life, meaning their schedule here and now and something that they're able to do for the foreseeable future. And while you're online, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps other people find this podcast when they're looking for information on exercise and when they're looking for information on health. So if you found value in this conversation today, let us know by leaving us that five-star rating and review. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. We always appreciate it. Have a fantastic week, and we'll talk with you all next week.